Thanks, and some things have to be said, so to our, our guest from France, you will find that writing on paper is easier than writing on water or cotton. We, 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 no, it had to be said. We, we, we've, come through, we've come through a very hard time. And you know, living in Ottawa, going through the recession, some days it feels almost unreal because you, you get the statistics of 50,000 jobs, 60,000 jobs lost. You, you, you hear the economy is recovering, you hear the economy is restructuring, and it all feels a little bit like an abstraction. And then you go to a mill town, and what were numbers and economic theories feels more like blood and heart. You go to a town, and you find people whose lives are destroyed, whose pensions have disappeared, whose sense of what their future is, where their home is going to be, has been uprooted. And living in Ottawa and working for the industry, I've always felt this huge disconnect between the economics, between the politics that we live in in Ottawa, and then the actual heart and blood that we experience in the industry as these things happen. And if there's one thing that we will have learned over the last three or four difficult years is doing what we used to do is simply not acceptable. It's just been too hard. And for everyone who's gonna follow us, for all the workers who don't want to lose their pensions, for all the towns who want to make a living in rural Canada and not have to move to the city, for everyone who depends upon the industry, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to ask, is there a better way? Is there a way for the Canada's forest industry to exist without this type of destruction? And there are various theories as to how things can get better. Because we're a cyclical industry, it's natural to think, well, we just have to wait for prices to get back. And you know, when I get interviewed by the press, that's usually the question they ask is, well, when's it coming back? When are the Americans going to move out from their parents' houses and build houses? And you know, when's it all going to come back? But, I think we've learned that trying to hold your breath through the bottom of the cycle means too many of us turn blue. I think we've learned that just waiting for the cycle to come back is just not enough. And there are some who say, well, the way to, the way to change things is to try much harder, smarter, and better at what we're doing and be the last man standing. Being the last man standing it's just not that smart an approach for 50 men. It simply will not get us to where we want to go. We have to change our business model. We have to make our business model sufficiently robust that we don't go through the sort of social destruction we've experienced over the last four years again. And to be fair, we've started that. What we've done is we've asked ourselves because all business models must start with this question, we've asked ourselves, what's happening in markets? And we've seen four trends to which we're responding. One, commodities are getting cheaper. It was ever thus, and we can never avoid responding to that. We must become more cost efficient year after year after year, and we have been. But getting more cost efficient, while entirely necessary, is entirely insufficient. Just getting cheaper does not mean you get to live. And if the global industry has learned anything over the last little while, that the business model that says he who cuts costs the fastest and the hardest will survive, lies. It's he who changes the fundamental business model who survives. So in addition to becoming more cost competitive, we also have to look at where markets are going 
And we know that the North American market will always be strong, but we have to better penetrate Asian markets, and we've been doing that. Over the last 10 years, we've increased our wood exports to China 21 times. We're the third biggest export from Canada to India and the biggest to China. Our dependence upon the U.S. market decreases month after month. Uh, so we're on that case. We're doing that part too. Another change in markets is that we cannot be just acceptable on the environmental side. We have to be world class. We have to be so far advanced that people come and knock on our door and say, how did you get there? That when Greenpeace points at another industry, they say, why can't you be like Canada's forest industry? Amazingly, we are getting there too. We're not good enough environmentally yet, but we're far better than most, and we are the only industry that's working hand in hand with the environmental community on a continual improvement process, and we are the only industry who Greenpeace refers to when they criticize the others and saying, why can't you follow their example and commit to environmental excellence? So those three things were on those paths, but even those three will not get us to a point where we are economically stable. The missing piece is extracting more value from every tree we harvest. And in the past, the debate has always been, can we add value? You know, can we build more furniture? Can we build more doors? Can, can, can we uh, make pianos out of our wood and uh, origami out of the paper? But the higher up the value chain we go that way, the more we end up competing on labor costs, which is not where our natural advantage is. So yes, we need higher value papers, and we're doing it. And yes, we need more uh, composite wood materials, and we're doing it. And yes, we need more building systems, and we're doing it. But that's not sufficient. What we have to do is extract more value as natural resource industry, which means extracting what comes out of the tree, uh, such as bioenergy and bioproducts. And that takes me to what it is that our study talks about, which is the opportunities for Canada's forest industry in the new bioeconomy. And the study outlines $200 billion of global market that we can exploit. $200 billion which Canada can compete for in products such as biofuels, bioethanol, biodiesel, textiles, cosmetics, siding, jet fuel additives, cosmetic additives, food additives, smart papers. And the reason why that market is there is because the world is shifting. The world is shifting to a appetite for materials that are biological. You know, people often talk about the succession of the global economy from agrarian to industrial to the information age. And none of these revolutions happened like overnight, okay, we're no longer agrarian, we're now using steam locomotives, or okay, we're no longer driving trains, we're now sitting and doing computers. All of these revolutions happened over time as one, uh, as the new thing became more and more important, as you use mechanization for agriculture, as you use information technology for industry. But if you look in the future, where things are going is adding in the layer of the bioeconomy, partly because as a, as a, a human population that's going to double, a, a, as a GDP that will double in the next 20 years, uh, facing all the challenges we do, one thing becomes clear. We are still biological beings. We can't escape biology. And some of the solutions to our problems have to be uh, harvested from what's in nature. And so from an engineering, from a problem solving, from an invention point of view, going to what's in nature uh, has become the single biggest growth edge of industrial revolution. From a consumer preference point of view, the concept of products that are of nature, that are produced in accordance with nature cycles, that are in their very essential being, 
green, replacing products that come from fossil fuels, replacing plastics, replacing uh, products where, such as steel uh, uh, that, that don't have the same uh, vitality. There's a huge consumer uh, appetite for finding ways of getting consumer goods that are essentially biological. And this movement towards a bioeconomy means $200 billion of marketplace just for forest products. And we are well poised to start thinking about how we can benefit from it. So the study we did called the uh, Biopathway Study asked the question, where and how can Canada's forest industry best use this opportunity of a $200 billion market. And it wasn't a, a casual study. We, we, had, we looked at 36 different technologies and traced them through various permutation and combinations. You take out this first, and then you go there, or you go there, and you go the other way. We, we partnered with the Innovation Institute and with six provincial governments and with NSERC and with uh, the federal government. Uh, we partnered with emerging biotech companies who loaned us their expertise. We brought in economists as well as chemists as well as uh, engineers. And the, the answers that came out were astonishingly clear. Even though yeah, we tested under three scenarios, oil prices skyrocket, oil prices collapse. Uh, we tested in three regions across the country. The answers came out consistently clear. The first answer, and those of you with a good scientific background will be happy to hear this. The first answer is, well, it depends. Depends where, when, what. All right. Uh, this, this, the second answer is yes, there is a robust market out there. And yes, we can compete in it. And yes, it will mean money for us. And yes, it will be economic value added and then interestingly, the answer came out clearly that in almost all cases, trying to make it work for Canada will not involve replacing the existing industry with these new opportunities, but rather adding them on to the existing industry. That it is the use of the waste stream from our existing industry Use, use of the woody residue stream from our industry that is the most attractive feedstock for all these new materials. And because the forests in Canada are owned by the people, we asked the question not just what makes sense economically, but what makes sense socially and what makes sense environmentally. And on all three metrics, consistently, time and time again, what we found is economically, if you have the tree already harvested and brought to the mill, you get the best economics for these new products. So integrate it into the existing industry. If you use these existing, if you use these new products to add value, you can run the mill for a much longer and more profitable time. And if you have several of these new products coming out, you can survive all sorts of changes in the marketplace because you've diversified the use of your fiber. So from an economic perspective, the most solid foundation, the most durable foundation, is actually adding these new bioeconomy products to the existing industry. From a social perspective, it was clear, clear, clear that standalone bioenergy, biochemical mills, in most circumstances, give you one-fifth, that's right, one in five jobs compared to integrating it. So in a country, in a country in which the forests exist for the sustaining rural population where we have had a genius, occasionally a misguided genius, but nonetheless a genius for translating our forest resources into rural employment, the message is very clear. We have to pursue these new technologies, but we have to pursue them in the integration, integrated into the existing industry rather than stand alone or we'll lose 80% of the employment. And then from an environmental perspective, some things are pretty clear. Harvesting a tree just for these things isn't as full 
and waste-free use of harvesting a tree for traditional purposes and adding these. It's a huge advantage to turn the waste stream, what used to be called a waste stream, into a value stream. It's a huge advantage for the feedstock for the bioeconomy being subjected to the same severe disciplines that the current forestry is subjected to from an environmental perspective. And it's a huge advantage to be able to substitute biological products harvested sustainably, uh, entirely renewable for some of the products that come from fossil fuels. I'm not saying that it's all figured out, and certainly on the environmental side, uh, we continue to work on the metrics of the carbon footprint. But one thing is pretty clear, integrated is going to give us a much better carbon footprint than standalone. So we have what is essentially a game changer. Extracting more value from every tree, giving what has been a difficult industry an economic foundation that's much wider, a footprint that's much more solid than what we, what we had in the past. We have the studies, and you know, the studies are in the internet, and they're available to members of FP Innovation and, and FPAC. Anybody here isn't a member, uh, we can talk to you after. Um, and, 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 and we have detailed analysis that each company can take home and see how it applies to you, and economic models that you can do to remodel based upon your individual situations. The opportunity is there. But will we, will we actually do it? And I, today at the press conference, I got quite a few questions. Well, it's nice that you've thought this up, but are you ever going to do it? And the answer is we are doing it now. Like most revolutions, it doesn't happen over, overnight. Uh, uh, there's huge activity. We're already producing enough bioenergy in our mills to replace three nuclear reactors. There are mills all across the country that are producing bioproducts, uh, everything from, from liquid fuels to, to uh, NCC to strength, strength of materials, to food additives, to stuff that makes plasma screens. We are there. Some of the products are in the developmental stage and are not commercial. Some are commercial. But we've come nowhere close to realizing the real potential. And to go that next step, to go from the portal, to go from the threshold of this huge possibility to fully occupying this possibility requires a few things. It requires that we in the industry not only continue to be entrepreneurial and inventive, it requires that we develop a new and more aggressive openness to new partnerships. Because the technology for these things will mostly come from other places. The expertise in harvesting and bringing the feedstock will come from the forest industry. And it's these new partnerships that will not only bring in the technology, it will bring in the capital. We're talking partnerships with the energy industry, the chemical industry, the textile industry, the new and exploding biotech industry. Our future will not be isolated. Our future will be integrated. They need us. We need them. And the marketplace is going to suck us all along this path. The other thing we need is government to understand that this is our future. We need governments to, first of all, ask themselves, what in my policy structure inhibits change? Because in the past, its temptation was always to say to government, help me, help me, I'm changing and hope that they'll do something to slow down the pain. We know, we know that is the path of self-destruction. The role of government is not to freeze the status quo. The role of government is not to subsidize a model that doesn't work. The role of government is, one, to get out of the way of change by making certain that the policies that are in place do not inhibit the speed of change. The role of government is, too, to support the necessary transformation. And the sort of support that is useful 
for the bioproducts, for the new biochemicals, is support for R&D and for the bringing of these products to commercial production. That's a legitimate role for government. And support for the retooling of our mills so that we can use more green energy and produce more biofuels. That also is a legitimate role for government. We'll have to give the government in Ottawa credit for most of its support to our industry has been exactly in that direction, green transformation and R&D. But we also have to acknowledge that in Europe, United States, China, all over the world, Brazil, the level of government support for transformation exceeds that in Canada. And would we be happy just competing company against company? Of course we would, if that were possible, but it's not. This is a international, not global, competitive field. You know, global is a bunch of players playing on the global marketplace. International is nation against nation. And it is the national, the national will to invest in change that's going to make the difference. And so we've been saying to, to provincial governments and to the government in Ottawa, what we need to see from you is continued, increased, and more aggressive support for the industry's transformation to these new products and to bioenergy. Not subsidize our operations, don't give us premiums for what we produce, don't try and save mills that are in trouble. Instead, join us in this change process and play your role as government. You know, I, I started by, by, by talking about the hard times that we've gone through. Uh, and the transformation model, better cost productivity, uh, new efficiencies, penetrating Asian markets, more environmental advantage, more market advantage from environmentalism, and now the entry into the bioeconomy. All those sound like economics, but frankly, it's a social agenda. That's what we got to do to keep the towns. That's what we got to do to keep the jobs. That's what we got to do to never have to say to people, your pension's gone. Thank you. <laughs>